is Dr. Dennis Nielsen, the Director of Pediatric Cystic Fibrosis Center at UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital in San Francisco, where he specializes in pediatric pulmonary medicine. Dr. Nielsen is also a health sciences clinical professor in the Department of Pediatrics at UCSF. In addition to his clinical duties, he conducts CF research and is a member of CFRI's Research Advisory Committee. And before we move forward, if you're going to continue conversation, please move outside the room. Otherwise, sit down and please pay attention. In 2015, Dr. Nielsen received CFRI's 2015 CF Champion Award in recognition of his significant contributions to the CF community. Please help me to welcome Dr. Dennis Nielsen for his presentation, GI Manifestations of CF, a Pulmonologist's Perspective. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, you might think that this title is a bit odd, and uh, I suppose it is. I don't have any special research to present in this area. Uh, so this won't be like Dr. Quitner's talk where she spent her career dealing with these kinds of problems. And this is more of a, uh, I suppose, I hope it's educational. And um, so I am not a GI expert, but I am a CF doctor. So we deal with certain things all the time. And when I get in trouble, I do call my gastroenterology friends to give us some help. Uh, so I just want to make that clear. Don't expect too much. Uh, don't make your questions too hard, please, OK? Um, but I do hope that there are a few new ideas that come out of this for you. And I'm, I'm sure there will be a lot of old information that many of you already know. Um, but again, this is a diverse audience, so people's level of understanding varies quite a bit. And of course, we, I have to tell you, you know, I get a little money from the NIH, uh, the CF Foundation, um, consultant for Gilead, uh, none of which has anything to do with this talk. OK, and you know we have the obligatory slide about what is CF. Uh, and I think all of you know this. I think the only important thing on this slide is that we're going to be talking mainly about the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, and the other important thing on this slide is the word chronic, because I think that much like what's happened in the world's, world of HIV, uh, we have taken CF from being the life-threatening disorder and turning it into a chronic illness. And that, more, I think, more and more is true. Uh, this is a schematic that uh, you may have seen. Of course, it's, you know, I, I forget where I co-opted this uh, drawing from, but you can find it on the internet. And it just shows that the, the CF protein is a very complex structure where you have these spans that are these lipid soluble areas of the protein that sort of just sit and dissolve into the lipid layer that we know as a cell membrane. Uh, and they, they form the channels. So this is a two-dimensional drawing, but in three dimensions, then these membrane spreading regions would would form a channel. There are charges. There's a diameter, all of which regulates, uh, to some extent, the flow of chloride and bicarbonate through this channel. And then you have these nucleotide binding domains, NBD1 and 2, that, uh, along with the R domain here, uh, form a type of gate that opens and closes and allows the chloride to move. So you have the, the channel. You have the gate. And dysfunction of this in a variety of ways is what we deal with in CF. And you've seen this, and, uh, and you know that we have all of, all of the um, elements of Murphy's Law here that anything that can go wrong will. And over the years, we've classified things in five or six different classes. I kind of like distinguishing between reduced synthesis and rapid turnover and using six classes instead of five. Maybe that's splitting hairs. And Another thing you need to understand about this is that these are not pure classifications. So we call five, uh, 508 uh, a type 2 mutation, a class 2 mutation. But it has other characteristics that fit into those other classes as well. And it's just that predominantly 
uh, enough of it doesn't get into the membrane to be useful. So, you know, we use these classifications. Some people now are beginning to talk about uh, classifying things uh, differently. Uh, but this is the this is the classic uh, scheme that we've used for many years. So, over 2,000 uh, mutations. Based on the talk last night, I need to change these slides and call them um, uh, variants, which I think is actually I, I really uh, like that suggestion. Because out of those 2,000, we think that maybe half of those cause problems. And it could be smaller than that. We know that if you look at CFTR2, the database where uh, there's an effort at, at Hopkins to try to gather information about the dysfunction in various mutations, it's about 130 now that are listed as disease causing. So you've got somewhere between 130 and maybe up to 1,000 that really cause difficulty for people. And then there are lots of other variations, genetic variations that don't seem to bother people too much. Uh, and amongst that, who knows, there may be even some, something that makes things better rather than worse. All right, so the most common mutation, F508-DEL, is found in about 80%, 86% of CF patients, according to the, to the CF registry from a couple of years ago. Uh, that number seems to be slipping a bit. We used to talk about, oh, it's close to 90%. Uh, if you look at in Caucasian populations, uh, that's true. But if you look at the demographics of CF in the United States, this is changing. California is very different. If you look at the percent of patients who have at least one copy of 508 in the California centers, you're going to find that it's actually lower than that. Uh, and that's because we have lots of Hispanic patients and other um, uh, patients from other parts of the world where the CF mutations are different. And um, you know, 508 Dell, we think, arose somewhere where my ancestors came from there in Scandinavia, you know, with all the Scandahuvians. And we really don't understand why it became so common uh, in, in that population in terms of, you know, what is the genetic advantage of being a carrier? Why would, why would this happen? Or is it all founder effect? I mean, the highest prevalence group is actually uh, a group of Amish in northern Ohio where it's one in 600 babies uh, is born with cystic fibrosis. And this is a very small, enclosed cultural group with a lot of uh, intermarriage. And, and so instead of being, you know, one in 3,000, it's one in 600. Uh, so that's quite a bit more common in that particular group, and it's, you know, it's, it's based on a founder effect. One of the founding fathers of that group happened to be a CF carrier. After you go past 508, you know, the frequency drops way off. If you ever look at the CF registry report, what you'll see is the next most common one uh, will be, you know, 4%, 3%, and very, com very quickly falls off. So that if you look at the, the 11 most common mutations, uh, those are all mutations with greater than 1% frequency. Once you get past that, it drops off. And you go, out, you go down 23 on the list of you know, frequency in the US, and now you're dealing with everything down to 0.1%. So you get you know, number 24 will be less than 0.1% of, of patients. And I've had patients over the years where um, one little girl that was actually turned out to be important in the search for the gene who had what looked like a new mutation. We knew from what's called DNA fingerprinting that she was the daughter of her mother and father. There wasn't, you know, a milkman in the mix somewhere there. I, are there any, there are some milkmen left somewhere, I think, but. Um, but she was her father's daughter. Her father did not uh, have a G CF gene. It did not have the same mutation. Her mother had a mutation that we found in the daughter, but this girl had very severe CF and ended up serving as one of the signposts when back in the 1980s people were walking and jumping down the gene or down the, the uh, chromosome trying to find the gene and identify it. And she turned out to have a, a key role in, in that. Um, severity of disease we think is based in large part on the mechanism of CFTR dysfunction and the CFTR dysfunction is based on which genes you have. 
However, when you look at the phenotype, we see huge variation in the phenotype, and you know we talk about a lot, a lot of that, um, a lot of times about that in our community, and we're sort of amazed. Well, why aren't all 508 homozygotes alike? You know, why don't they all get sick at the same time? And we have some who are very healthy, and you know, is it because they go out and run five miles every day? Is that why they're so healthy? Well, certainly. Adherence to therapies and uh, exercise have uh, important roles in, in um, maintaining health in CF patients, but uh, that's not all the story because there's an awful lot of information in each CF gene that varies from one person, one family to another. All the information, you know, in those intronic, the, the spaces in between genes, the spaces of the gene that uh, regulate uh, function. Uh, when you look at uh, a human gene, you know, it's just not, you, you see these long strands. So the RNA looks like that, but the DNA is actually, here's a little strand of the gene and then there's a bunch of stuff in between. Here's another little piece of the gene that gets translated into RNA and, and then a bunch of stuff. And so it's really, um, it's, it's very different than, it's not just one long strand of DNA with nothing in between the, active, the known active parts. So there's stuff going on in there that at this point we still don't completely understand. And as a result then, even if people have uh, two copies of 508 or, or some other gene and you look at them, they're different. Uh, and we see differences in what happens between siblings. Uh, and I, I think if you talk to any one who's been in the business for a while, they can tell you stories about, well, here's a brother and a sister. The sister dies at age uh, you know, 10, and the brother's still going strong at age 40. And you know, why the difference? Uh, is it all explained by how they took care of themselves? They're in the same family, they're raised pretty much the same, have the same values, and yet their outcome in terms of their CF is very, very different. And we've all seen that kind of variability, even with, within a family, uh, uh, siblings. Okay, so, um, according, well, let's see, this, this is, I forgot to change this. this is, these numbers are actually from the 2014 registry. So I did update it. So we have, you know, nearly 30,000 people in the U.S. Uh, that are followed in the registry. And in the last few years, we are really essentially at 50-50. So about half of our patients, pretty much half our patients, are 18 and older. Uh, and the median survival uh, during the last few years has really approached uh, 40, 41 years of age. And you know, when you look at the annual data, it kind of wobbles a little bit. But when you draw your best line through everything, this is really where we are. And I would contrast that, uh, you know, I've been around doing this a long time, so, in, uh, you know, one of the key um, numbers for me is that in 1981, when I had my first faculty job, um, median survival for CF was 18. And now we're there. And that's without really having any kind of a breakthrough around for a long time. And you can see the improvement, actually. There are two things I want you to see here. One is, these pink dots represent data from 2004. The blue dots represent data from 2014. The two little red crosses here, that's actually, I'm exposing myself here. This is our center. Um, and you can see that what's happened in those years is that everybody's moved up. This cluster has all moved up to better and better lung function. Uh, and uh, you know, we did the same. Hopefully we did a little faster than the rest of the country, uh, but not, not very different. The other thing that you see here is that here's FEV1% predicted, so that's an important measure of lung function, and here is the percentile for BMI. So this is the link. You know, this is kind of an important link between how well people do the thing that is most life-threatening, most health-threatening. The lung disease actually correlates with this thing down here called BMI, which is pretty strong evidence that 
if you eat well, you maintain your weight, uh, you maintain your health, overall health, uh, that your lungs are going to be healthier too. Exactly how that works, we don't know. Uh, and does being chubby uh, work better than just being normal? You know, the data don't really tell us that. I can tell you that um, I used to, was at one time the center director and the center in the U.S. It's not San Francisco, but the center in the U.S. that had the best pulmonary outcomes in the pediatric population. And our kids were a little, they weren't fat, you know. They just, they were never up there above, you know, this uh, in terms of the BMI percentiles. They weren't clear up here. Because in BMI, 50% is the average. And that would represent a healthy weight. So having a BMI that's at the 60th percentile means you're a little chubby. So is that a good thing in a CF patient? Well, you know, I still don't know. But I do know that when you look at this whole curve, that it's not good to be, in general, not good to be down here. Although the, there are these anomalies. You know, here's a center right here, two centers, that have good pulmonary outcomes, and yet their kids are a little skinny. So what is that about? I don't know. Anyway, you can see that in general, when you look at the, the whole cohort, you see this correlation, and we think this is an important thing. And so a lot of the things that we do in, in our CF centers are based on this particular piece of information. Okay, so now we're going to try to connect the CF uh, abnormality to the intestinal tract. And what is it that's different in CF uh, that, that causes problems in the GI tract. Well, we know that normally the stomach is full of acidic, uh, acidic solution, that there are cells there that actually uh, secrete acid, and you have a very low pH. It's about 1 to 2, which is low enough that if you put it out on the concrete sidewalk, it would start eating the concrete pretty quickly. And we know that that gets neutralized in the small intestine by bicarbonate that is secreted from the lining of the intestines, Bruner's glands, the ductal epithelium of the pancreas, and the biliary tract. And so the pancreatic secretions that come out and enter the small bowel right after you go from the stomach into the small intestine, there's the, the common bile duct. So you get bile coming in from the liver and the gallbladder, and you get uh, enzymes coming in from the pancreas, but along with that, you're also getting a lot of bicarbonate that neutralizes the acid then in the small intestine. So in CF, then you know, everybody, I think, ho hopefully everyone knows that the pancreatic ducts are plugged up with thick stuff, and in some ways, they probably don't even develop so that by the time you're born, uh, the pancreas isn't working, the, this part of the pancreas isn't working properly. You can't get the enzymes out. You make them, but they're stuck inside the gland. And they don't come out in that duct. The other thing that doesn't come out, though, is also this bicarbonate-rich uh, fluid. So uh, if you have absent CFTR protein, this thing that acts as a chloride or a bicarbonate channel, and we think that in the pancreas, its role uh, as a bicarbonate transporter is, is really very, very important. So if that's absent or not functional, uh, then you end up not only with a deficit of water that gives you viscous secretions in the gut, but you also end up with uh, secretions that are acidic because the acid-secreting cells in the stomach are able to do their job. They're right there on the surface, and they're pouring out the acid, they get into the small intestine, and the bicarbonate that's supposed to neutralize that acid then isn't there. So you have uh, more acid secretions in the small bowel, and this has several effects. So um, one of the important effects is that this adversely affects the pH of the, of the liquid in the, in the lumen of the bowel, the natural secretions that are there, uh, you know, if you're not talking about, we're not talking about food or poop or anything, just the secretions that are normally there if you were fasting, say. These then should be 
become very quickly become uh, neutralized by the bicarbonate. In, that, in those secretions, just like in the lung, there are antimicrobial proteins that the epithelial cells also secrete, things with funny names like the defensins and lysozyme and other things that are, that are natural antibacterials. So they help control uh, the, uh, you know, people, we, we use the term microbiome. It's the microbial garden. So your gut is clearly never sterile. If it is, you're, you're in trouble because you need the bacteria there. But the bacteria that you see in someone who has CF tends to be one that's very distorted uh, and very far off of normal. Uh, and so the bacteria that are, that are there are not necessarily the friendly ones that you want there that, that uh, help in the process of digesting the food. And in fact, there's some evidence, uh, um, uh, some, uh, it seems like the majority of this has come from an Italian group, that lactobacillus, you know, the probiotic, I mean, when people say probiotic, they're talking about lactobacillus, various strains of it. There is some evidence that if you have CF uh, as a baby or uh, even as an adult, that this can uh, modify uh, things that happen in the lung and certainly uh, potentially happen in the gut as well. And when you look at, you know, when you look at what's happening in the gut, uh, in the intestine, in CF patients, it's different. You do have signs of inflammation. You have increased numbers of white cells and inflammatory molecules there in people who have classic CF. So even though we think about those things as being something that happens in the lung, they also, they also do happen in the intestinal tract. So this is kind of what's going on there. And everything that comes from that, uh, or follow, everything that happens goes wrong in the lung, uh, follows from, from the, sort of those basic ideas. So in the lung, or excuse me, in the, in the gut, see I'm a pulmonologist, but if you're in the intestinal tract, then you know what, what happens is, is that you also, just like in the lung, you do have uh, a lack, an absence of sufficient water, a deficit of water in these secretions, so they tend to get thick, there is some uh, mucus type material that's secreted into the gut. Um, this has an effect on intestinal motility so that when you look how f at how fast move, uh, food moves through your intestinal tract, it tends to move slower in uh, CF, which certainly doesn't help. And so you've got thick stuff. It's not moving through very fast. The motility is off. Uh, some of the slowness is due to the physical properties of the material that's in the intestine. And then uh, you get repeated or chronic antibiotic exposure, and that alters the kind of bacteria that you see there. You have low intestinal pH, which also helps select out certain types of bacteria. Uh, and then you can end up with this combination. One of the problems that you get is bacterial overgrowth. And I don't know how many of you have had children who've developed that problem and Sometimes it happens uh, after you've gone through an IV course for a clean out, you know, the, the tune up in the hospital, and then they get diarrhea while they're on the antibiotics, and usually it gets better after the antibiotics stop, but sometimes it doesn't. And then, uh, you know, we may, this is one of the reasons we may send them to our GI colleagues because they'll uh, do some studies, look at the bacteria that they find there, and then undertake things like they'll put them on a very long course of metronidazole, which is uh, also known as flagyl, and it's an antimicrobial that uh, helps with this problem of bacterial overgrowth. Uh, and sometimes they go to extremes. I don't know if you've ever heard of fecal transplants, but uh, that's been resorted to at times when this becomes a very chronic problem. Kind of gross to think about, but. And you have to have normal poop, you know. Um, all right, so um, the pathophysiology, so it takes longer to neutralize stomach acid. That has an impact on what's happening in the intestine. Uh, this has an impact on pancreatic enzymes because they're, they're, uh, when we're giving the enzymes, you know, they're those little micro granules that are inside the capsule, they all have a pH sensitive coating. 
So they're made not to actually break open until the pH gets above about 5.5. And so they're just in there in the gut and they're still, they're staying as little granules and they're not really doing anything until they get far enough down to, uh, that the pH comes up. And so this is one of the reasons that we do things like give proton pump inhibitors, you know, like Prevacid, Prilosec, and, and decrease the amount of stomach acid so that those enzymes get released earlier and start working sooner. Uh, low pH also causes micelles to precipitate. Well, micelles are like uh, little droplets, um, or in, in a way they're almost like artificial cells, but you have, you have uh, water and you have a bunch of, uh, of uh, little molecules that have a polar head that's water soluble and a, and a tail that's, uh, that's lipid soluble. And this is an important part, forming these little globules is an important part of the, the digestive process. Uh, and so as the food gets broken down, uh, micelle formation is, is uh, deficient, and that has an impact on digestion. Uh, and giving pancreatic enzymes doesn't really fix that. Uh, it, you also, because of, uh, of, of this problem, it decreases the ability of antimicrobial proteins, as we mentioned. Uh, to kill the bacteria, altered microbiome, and it makes mi gut mucins less slippery. So mucins are supposed to be slimy and slippery, and uh, they're pH sensitive, and, and they don't, their physical properties are different if the pH is too acidic. Uh, and this all then results in a, in a slow transit. Okay, so, you know, what's, what are the common and in this case, the earliest things that we see happen as a result of all this. Well, this is s sort of the um, sentinel iconic thing that we think about, meconium ileus, which um, is the earliest clinical presentation of CF. So depending on what, how you look at this, somewhere between 13, 17% of newborns with CF will have meconium ileus or, or at least uh, obstruction. They don't all go to surgery, but they are obstructed. And you know, if you look at what happens in, in the nursery, one of the things a pediatrician does is they look for passage of meconium in the first 24 hours. So I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't, for anyone who doesn't know what meconium is, it's baby poop. It's the stuff that the baby is forming when they're in utero and it's kind of green and sticky. And if you have CF meconium, it's really sticky, it's really thick, and it has a tendency to plug, uh, plug the, the intestinal tract. And so you get an obstruction of the intestine uh, in utero, and you can't have perforations, and when you have perforations, then uh, the fetus is actually getting a form of peritonitis, and they, they get these calcifications in their stomach. So if you... Um, do an x-ray or you do an ultrasound, you can see these concretions uh, that are outside the bowel that have actually spilled out into the peritoneal cavity. Uh, most of the time, fortunately, there isn't perforation, and most of the time you can manage this uh, medically. So that first 24 hours is, is uh, critical, and uh, you know there's a board question, a medical board question. So you, know, you have a newborn baby who uh, has not past meconium and they have bilious vomiting in the first 24 hours. You gotta think of CF. It's a, it's a classic presentation. So bilious vomiting in a newborn. All right, more than half of patients with meconium ileus will have CF. Now, you know, the numbers have changed over the years. I can tell you, you know, years ago, people used to say 90%. It's less now. We do see babies with other problems that present with, uh, with obstruction because of meconium. But, you know, if you see this, you better start thinking about CF. This problem uh, occurs most commonly with the type 2 mutations that include 508, G542X, W1282, these, these things that result in little or no functional CFTR in, this, in the cell membrane. And the most common treatment is uh, you use a gastrographin enema uh, to clean it out. Uh, that works very well, or some kind of an enema to get things moving. 
Surgery is a last resort. And an interesting thing is, as I was getting ready for this, I did go and look at a surgery text. And um, they say that surgery is the first resort, right? You know? For me as a clinician, that's the last resort. And if you're in a hospital that doesn't deal with CF, you know, you may be, your baby might get surgery that's unnecessary from the very get-go because of, because of this issue of uh, understanding CF and meconium ileus and how you deal with it. So this is what it looks like on an x-ray. And you can, you, know, you can just see here, all, here's the stomach. And here, you know, the large intestine. And you've got small intestine here in the middle part of this. And you can see all these dilated loops of bowel that are filled with mostly air, but you know, gas, air plus other gases um, that are generated. And what you don't see is you don't see any air down here in the rectum. And so this baby is occluded. And you get all this backup of air. And, and this is a baby that's, uh, that's in some trouble. And then here's a picture of a gastrographin enema. And you can see, you know, you can see here's the rectum. And you can see the dye coming up. And you can see how thin this is. This is colon. The colon is usually the, you know, the biggest part of your intestinal tract. It's usually quite large in comparison to the small bowel. But because there's this obstruction, what happens is the colon looks small and shrunken because there's not much in it. And the obstruction is up really in the small intestine. So that's what it looks like. And this is obviously a baby that's getting treated for that particular problem. And you can see that it does, they do get all the way up into uh, other parts of the colon. So ascending, transverse, and descending colon. So you see the ascending colon here actually looks pretty normal in diameter, but it's full of the, the dark stuff that you see in there. That's the poop. OK, that's the meconium that's stuck there. Uh, and then you have some fluid around it. But the real obstruction is really right in here. And beyond that, there isn't, just isn't much material. OK, so. Um, Back in the olden times, we used to call this meconium ileus equivalent. Uh, you know, it is an equivalent. And the foundation decided, I don't know, 20 years ago to change the name to DIOS, Distal Intestinal Obstruction Syndrome. So I don't know if anybody here knew the old name, but this is what we call it now. So it's a lot longer, and we shorten it to that because it's too long to repeat too many times. And uh, in this case, you're talking about it's usually um, children. So most often this doesn't, this doesn't happen as frequently in adults, but it can. It can happen at any age. But what you get is you get thick, sticky fecal material, clings to the villi and the crypts in the terminal ileum, and, um, and it tends to recur. So if you've had one episode, you're more likely to have another episode. So once you have it, you know, you have to work hard not to have this happen again. The clinical presentation is abdominal pain, vomiting, distension, right-sided mass. So you know, when your CF doctor is filling the tummy, that's what they're feeling for. They're feeling for, uh, for fecal masses that, uh, that might be there before you develop this problem, or if you come in with this problem, trying to figure out if there is a fecal mass that would explain it. Uh, it can chronically be quite chronic, and you can mimic constipation and it can mimic appendicitis, which is also more common in people with CF, kids with CF, than in the rest of the population. Uh, and of course, kidney stones and gallstones are also more common in kids with CF. And so this can be sometimes a very confusing diagnosis. Uh, you know, when is it these other things, and when is it um, the dios? And so you know, we use a variety of ways of, of making this diagnosis, including CT scanning and other things to, to sort that out. So uh, what we do is we will treat with large volume PEG, which is polyethylene glycol. Uh, and if you mix polyethylene glycol with uh, an electrolyte solution, we call it uh, Golightly. And if it comes in a powder, we call it Miralax. Or now there are generics, so you can get the Walgreens brand of, of uh, PEG. Uh, and this is delivered through a nasogastric tube. And you put in a large volume. And you know one of the problems that we have in our hospital, now that we have hospitalists, um, they get nervous about putting four liters of fluid down an NG tube in a child. 
but that's what you have to do. And they're, you know, oh, well, let's be nice to the baby. And when, you know, and so you end up turning this into a more chronic thing. And so you have to go out very aggressively. You give large volumes of fluid through the nas nasogastric tube, and you, uh, you force it out. The, the uh, polyethylene glycol pulls fluid into the gut and uh, creates an environment where you can break these things free and then uh, stimulating contraction, they move out. Uh, Mucomist does have a place here. Uh, it does seem to break up thick CF uh, feces, and it will, will uh, help. We don't do this very often, and it's nasty stuff. I don't know um, how many of you have occasion to encounter Mucomist, but it smells like rotten eggs, and you're going to have somebody drink a bunch of this stuff uh, that we used to nebulize all the time. And then if this doesn't work, if you're doing uh, PEG and you're doing some fleets and enemas and other things and you're not getting any results, then a gastrograph and enema to the terminal ileum is uh, sort of the next step. And you need to have a radiologist who's comfortable and experienced with this procedure. Uh, and the gastrograph uh, will help also pull water into the gut, uh, break things up, and then allow it to clear out. And sometimes you have to repeat it uh, to get it to work. Uh, and you try to keep people with dios away from the surgeons. Because I've also seen several kids come from outlying hospitals where they've had appendectomies or they've had exploratory laparotomies uh, because of this obstruction. And what they really needed was they needed this approach. Um, and this is what the gastrograph and enema looks like in an adult with dios. Looks an awful lot like the baby from before, right? You see, you know, you see the the rectum, the colon, descending colon. Here's the ascending colon, terminal ileum down here. And in here, if you look, you'll see these dilated loops of bowel that are really small intestine. Looks a lot like what we saw in the baby. So that's. Part of the reason people called it meconium ileus equivalent. Uh, but in, in the wisdom of the foundation, we now call it this thing. OK. Um, by the way, if anybody has any questions, please ask. And we we'll should have time, hopefully, at the end, time for lots of questions. All right, so the most common problem is malabsorption. Prior to newborn screening, this was the most common sign in the first year of life. So 60% or more of babies were, that were diagnosed in the first year were diagnosed because of failure to thrive. And the failure to thrive was the result of the fact that they were not absorbing fats and proteins and complex carbohydrates. And they tended to have very frequent, very frequent stools. So you know, breastfed babies tend to have small, frequent stools. So that can make it a little hard. And, the babies actually tend to grow OK for the first few months. Uh, and so they, you know, well, they're not falling off the growth curve, but they may do well for three or four or even six months. And then they just stop gaining weight. And you see the stool frequency, instead of having, um, having normal baby poops, they will be more frequent than normal, 10 or 12 a day. They will be very poorly formed. They might be oily. Uh, they, they're, you know, I mean, poop stinks, but this really stinks. Um, and, uh, and then chronic abdominal distension is another sign that you see. And if you take a, a belly film, you just see this intestine full of, full of poop. So it almost looks like the dios, except it hasn't really gotten to a point where it's not moving. So it's still moving, but everything is backed up. Uh, so, you know, you can compensate for it by increasing your intake, which is why, um, in, in past years, when we weren't uh, diagnosing at two weeks of age with newborn screens, uh, a lot of the kids would have these histories of just voracious appetites because they were trying to compensate for the fact that they weren't, being, uh, they weren't able to absorb their nutrients. Uh, and then the drop off on the growth curve doesn't happen right away. So it can happen later. All right. Um, it's the result of exocrine pancreatic dysfunction. So you know the pancreas has two 
different classes of function, exocrine, which means that it's excreting into a duct system, and endocrine, which means it's making insulin and secreting directly into the bloodstream. Um, we're not going to talk about CF-related diabetes, but the exocrine part of the pancreatic dysfunction looks uh, something like something like this. So you get all of these thick secretions. You can get concretions. You can get stones. You get pseudocysts form. Uh, everything gets uh, inflamed, and you have destruction of normal structures. Uh, these ducts are really not uh, very well developed. Uh, and so what happens? So growth in the first two years. This is from a real patient. Uh, and you know you can see that this baby didn't grow very well initially. It was down here below the third percentile. The diagnosis is made and then starts growing a little better. And then something good happens here, because this happened to be a baby with G551D uh, that we started early. OK. Let's see, we talked about this. All right, what happens, so most babies, most people with CF start pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy. That's what PERT stands for. Uh, they start early in life, but even with that growth can still be a struggle. So PERT does not completely correct nutri nutritional defects. It doesn't correct those other things that we talked about. People with uh, type 3 gating mutations have classic severe CF with malabsorption. But now we have this drug that came out in 2012. And so the question is, what happens when you do that? And here you go. Uh, for one thing, uh, if you look at gut pH, so this is a recording of uh, pH in the intestinal tract. And this is a CF patient before Ivacaftor, has G551D508, and this is after Ivacaftor. And if you compared this upper tracing to someone who didn't have CF, they, they look the same. And so you can see the delay in achieving higher pHs. You know, it doesn't look like the two curves are very different, but if you draw a horizontal line from, say, here to here, you have to go quite a ways back. So the pH really isn't in the range, normal range, until quite a ways down through the intestinal tract. And if you look at what happens with growth, uh, this is one of our patients who had a type 3 mutation, not G551D. Uh, and uh, she was actually started um, before her mutation was approved. Uh, and this is what we saw. She always actually, her nutrition was not a big problem. She was always around the 50th percentile. But uh, we put her on the drug because her lung disease was really awful. Uh, she was within a year or two of a transplant, lung transplant, as a 12-year-old. And this is what happened to her weight. So now she has to exercise and watch her diet and all that stuff. And uh, so this is, you know, this is the clinical benefit, a clinical benefit. But it means you also have to change lifestyle because uh, one of the things Ivacaftor Kaleidico has um, done to patients with uh, these gating mutations is that they can, get, they can get overweight, which we don't want. We want healthy kids. All right. So optimizing PERT, I wanted to put this in because I'm not sure everyone understands uh, the difference between two, the two main tests that we use in CF to try to figure out what the doses are. So I'm, actually, the most common test we use is the growth chart you know, and the history. Do you have frequent stools? Are they oily? Blah, blah, blah. You know, the questions you get asked at every CF visit, tummy pain, and so on. But uh, for a number of years now, we've had this test called Human fecal pancreatic elastase one that uh, we use, actually use it in the newborns to try to figure out whether people are pancreatic sufficient or insufficient. Uh, this is actually a technique that detect, detects only human elastase. Uh, so it, and it very nicely reflects adequacy of pancreatic um, enzyme delivery of the normal human enzymes, not what you're putting in the mouth, but what's coming out uh, out of the pancreatic duct. And it is not affected by taking uh, pancreatic enzymes, because those are non-human. They're all porcine. Uh, and uh, this test can tell the difference. So the baby 
can take their enzymes so you're not messing up their nutrition, and you can still do this test. And it takes 10 grams of poop, which I say is usually about that much, the tip of my baby finger. You need that much, you send it off, it comes back a couple of weeks later, and you'll get a report that will tell you uh, how much is there. Although, generally speaking, when it's over, the, over 500 micrograms of enzyme per gram of stool, um, they just say it's greater than 500. So, uh, but normal is considered over 200. 1 to 200 is moderate insufficiency, and less than 100 is severe pancreatic insufficiency. So this tells us whether or not somebody is pancreatic sufficient or insufficient. So you're looking for that 5 to 10% that are sufficient. 70-hour stool fat. I don't know how many of you have had your, been through this or had your kids go through it. It's, uh, a, it's a difficult test to do because you've got to capture all the poop, right? And that's just hard to do, especially in little kids. And even in the hospital, we find this, we have to start over uh, because we, we lose a sample and then you can't do the quantitation. So what does this do that this doesn't do? Well, this measures the amount of undigested fat in the stool and you should normally have less than seven grams per fat per day in an adult, less than two per day in children, less than one in breastfed infants. Uh, and you're really trying to measure the adequacy of the enzyme dose. So what this tells you is you know what goes in, you know what comes out, and you look at how much of that fat that went in uh, gets consumed by the body and how much of it ends up being wasted in stool. And so this really should be um, about this. So you're taking 21 grams of fat in 72 hours. Uh, and you take, again, this is on a, based on a 100 gram per day fat diet. OK, so that's what you're looking for. So this is very useful then to figure out how much uh, enzyme you should be giving someone. All right. so. We already said this, you know, you really need to follow a normal line. And one of the major signs is if you're falling off this curve, you may need your enzymes uh, adjusted. So, you know, somewhere 10 to 15 percent, this number is changing again because of newborn screening. We're picking up milder cases earlier. And so the percent of pancreatic sufficient patients is actually going up because we're capturing them earlier. We're not seeing the late diagnoses anymore in California, or at least not very many of them. Uh, th these patients, the pancreatic sufficient, are usually type 4, 5, 6, if you like to split up 5 into 5 and 6. Um, some people with pancreatic sufficiency eventually will become insufficient. And even if you're pancreatic sufficient, some people still benefit from small doses of enzyme. We see this, you know, they gain weight a little better. If we have, we have kids that are normal, sufficient, and we add a little enzyme, and they grow better. Uh, and this is also a population that uh, is more prone to develop uh, pan recurrent pancreatitis. Uh, and we have a con chronic pancreatitis program at, the, at our uh, program. And one of our patients uh, with CF that was diagnosed by newborn screen who has a mild form. She's very tall and lovely and really bright. Uh, but, you know, her first hospitalization was for pancreatitis, not for uh, lung problems. OK, so uh, abdominal pain, radiation to the back, feels worse after eating, nausea, vomiting, tenderness when touching the uh, abdomen. So this is another one that you, know, you might confuse with uh, the dios problem. It's most common in teen and young adults, and sometimes it's at graduation when kids go out and party and they drink a little too much alcohol because that stimulates the uh, pancreas as well. And uh, if you look at the difference, it's much more common in pancreatic sufficient patients. All right, so uh, pancreatitis and CF. We have people who develop pancreatitis, uh, and we have pancreatitis patients that we see. So the, our program is following about 50 chronic pancreatitis kids right now. And out of that group, uh, we've had two that meet criteria for CF. They have two disease-causing mutations and a positive sweat test. We also have two more that are suspicious, where they have one mutation of unclear significance and a CF-causing mutation and a normal sweat test, but they have chronic pancreatitis. 
so we don't know what to call them. All right. Rectal prolapse, we don't talk about it much anymore, don't see it much anymore. You can prevent it by doing uh, uh, good, you know, using your enzymes appropriately. That's the most important thing. And things like Miralax and other things to keep stool soft are important. And if you do see it, you know, the acute treatment is you put on a glove, you get a little gauze that you moisten, and you shove it in and hold it there for a while, and then hold the cheeks together. Um, and you look at the literature, if you don't have CF and you have this problem, you need surgery. If you have CF and you have this problem, you just need to take care of your, uh, your uh, enzymes and stool, stool uh, hygiene better. Okay, GER, more prevalent in CF. Uh, this may alter respiratory bacteria because of recurrent small aspiration. Um, more than half the CF patients receive acid inhibitors not just because they have reflux and esophagitis, but also because this sometimes helps enzymes work better. And if you want to see, so class one through three, so the severe mutations, mild mutations, you can see dios is more common here. GERD is about the same. Pancreatitis is much more common, uh, 20 times as common in the milder mutations. And rectal prolapse, uh, probably a little higher in the class one through three. So this is from uh, the CF Foundation report. I uh, just wanted to mention newborn screening very briefly. You can see that the number of children diagnosed per year by newborn screening was going up, it's continued to go up. And uh, as of 2010, all 50 states are screening. So that number keeps, the, keeps going up. Okay, so just in conclusion, many complications of CFTR dysfunction, uh, including those in the GI tract, therapies for CF are improving rapidly, as we all know. And with early diagnosis and better treatment, we should be able to prevent a lot of these complications of, of in, uh, the intestinal complications of cystic fibrosis. So that's it. I hope there was something there for, for most people. All right, thank you, Dr. Nielsen. Uh, we do have time for questions. I do want to remind you to limit your question to one per person and uh, speak into the microphone and a volunteer will clean and adjust the microphone for you. Oh, good, somebody's standing up. <laughs> yes. Hello, and thank you very much for this very informative presentation. I am wondering, um, in patients where there's pancreatic insufficiency uh, because the pancreatic ducts are plugged, what is the impact of the high fatty diet, high caloric um, diet, uh, in the pancreas producing more enzymes? And if the ducts are plugged, is that something that could be harmful to the pancreas over time? Uh. You know, I don't know that anyone can answer your question completely, but most of the children who are pancreatic insufficient, by the time they're born, the pancreas, the, the exocrine part of the pancreas is so badly damaged that there's no return of function. So you may have heard that um, some of the kids who have G551D, so there have been a couple of cases um, where they've had uh, improvement in CF-related diabetes or in pancreatic uh, function on Kaleidico, Ivacaftor. Those are rare, uh, as far as we know. And the vast majority of children who have the, that small group that has the mutation that we do the best with with these new drugs, and we can actually correct most of the defect, uh, still continue to be pancreatic insufficient. Um, and I can tell you from uh, in the old days when we were searching for the gene, I used to go to, to autopsies in young adults who died of CF, and we were collecting trachea and pancreas to try to get DNA in the search for the gene. And so I would, I would go to these, I would collect the tissue, and then we would uh, harvest the DNA from those cells, uh, trying to figure out where the, use it to try to help figure out where the gene uh, was. And, um, the, the pancreas in you know, an 18-year-old or a 20-year-old with CF, 
back in the early 1980s was just, you really couldn't call it an organ. It looked like a piece of chicken fat. It was really uh, essentially totally destroyed, even though these were kids, most of them didn't have CF-related diabetes, but the structures were just all gone. So this happens pretty early in life, I think. And um, if we do find great treatments, unless uh, we can do in utero uh, therapy to try to prevent the damage, you know, we're not going to change that part of CF with the pharmacologic approach. So I don't, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't think I can answer your question completely. But I, I, I don't think you can make anything worse than it already is, because it's pretty bad in that particular function. OK, so presumably, if the fatty foods and the high caloric diet would stimulate production of the pancreatic enzymes, and presumably I mean, the, cause Yeah, the question is, theoretically, would it be more destructive? And yes. It, and it might be, but, but you're not going to see any benefit or any, any worsening in clinical course because of that, because uh, the, uh, it just doesn't get out anyway. And people who are pancreatic insufficient, there's just not much there. It would only be the people who are sort of in the, the gray zone, where there's you know, moderate insufficiency, uh, where that might be a factor. Um, but okay. I, I don't know of any studies in that area to answer your question. Thank you. Already a hard question. OK, come on, guys. Take it easy on me. <laughs> Hi, thank you very much for your presentation. I think I do have a, a simple question for you. My name is Monica, my husband's Bob. We're here from uh, Salem, Oregon. And we do have two twin girls with uh, diagnosed with CF at birth. A lot of the stuff you showed on their screen, they've been through, uh, they have G551D, Delta 508, and the perforations on the day they were born. Um, so their toddler years, all the GI stuff um, was an issue. Now they both have non-tuberculosis, um, I mean, yeah, NTM bacteria yeah. in their lungs. Um, one is not doing as well as the other. Something you mentioned was interesting. It was the lactobacillus, something pretty simple. Um, and you mentioned, I always thought that worked helping the gut more, but you also mentioned that it helps the lung function. Of course, yeah, we're interested. The, the, yeah, this is still, I mean, it's controversial, and the okay. evidence isn't, you know, the evidence isn't that strong, but I can tell you that um, at least uh, one of the, the, it was mainly this Italian group has published several papers on it, that even in adults with CF, that, uh, that uh, ingesting lactobacillus probiotics, uh, probiotics seems to have an impact on the microbiome that you see in the lungs. So we all aspirate a little bit every day, and, and so there's some spillover into the respiratory tract. And, uh, there's some evidence that that might be beneficial. So, I, you know, I wouldn't go out and encourage everyone to do mega dosing of, of lactobacillus, but there's not much of a downside to eating yogurt and, right. and doing the probiotic thing. And it, it may, in fact, be helpful. Right. I was just getting, and that was my question. Do you prescribe that to your patients and about how much do you we, prescribe? Yeah, we Thank start you. a lot of our babies on probiotics. And actually, over in Europe, every baby gets probiotics in their formula. I think they've just adopted that. And... Uh, you know, we would criticize them for being unscientific. Uh, on the other hand, we may just be slow adopters, so I'm not sure which is correct. Thank you, Dr. Nielsen. Um, your talk was really profound. I think everybody learned a lot. Um, I'm wondering if you're going to come back tomorrow for the Ask the Experts panel at 10 o'clock? I'll be here. You will be, great, because there are a number of people here, including myself, that have questions. But I know we're running out of time, and we have to turn the room over for lunch. So um, I will ask my question tomorrow. But I just okay. want to make sure that you're Good. coming tomorrow. Great. Thank you. Thanks again, Dr. Nielsen. Well, yep, it's that time again. Uh, time for lunch. <laughs>